The next topic in our discussion of data preprocessing is class imbalance. This is something we already talked about in last lecture, where we discussed the problems it can cause for the test set. We know what we can do to help our analysis of imbalance problems, but how do we actually improve training? To reiterate what we said in the last lecture, make sure that you use a big test set. This is important in general, but it's even more important when you have class imbalance. Don't rely on accuracy, try ROC plots, precision recall plots, or area under the curve, and look at the confusion matrix. Given that we're using these metrics to evaluate our models, let's look at some tricks you can use to improve the performance you get if your training data is unbalanced. The first trick we'll look at is resampling your training data, and the second is the use of data augmentation. The most common approach is to take your minority class and oversample it by sampling with replacement. So you simply sample with replacement a large number of instances from your minority class and you add those to your data. In other words, you create a new data set where instances from your minority class occur multiple times. The advantage is that this leads to more data. The disadvantage is that you end up with duplicates in your data set. Some models don't mind duplicates, but some do. And in general, this may increase the likelihood of overfitting. An alternative approach is undersampling. You sample without replacement instances from your majority class. This doesn't lead to duplicates, but it does mean you're throwing away a lot of data. If you use an algorithm that makes multiple passes over the data set, like stochastic gradient descent, which we explained last week, what you can do is resample the data set fresh, fresh for every pass so that you get the best of both worlds. A different balance of classes, and you still get to use every instance in your data. A more sophisticated approach is to oversample the minority class with new data, which is cleverly derived from the existing data. This avoids the problem of including duplicates in your data set. The SMOT approach is a good example of this. It finds small clusters of points in the minority class, generates their mean, and includes these as new minority class points. This way, the new point is not a duplicate of any existing point, but it is still in a region that contains a lot of points in the minority class. We don't have time to go into this very deeply, but if you run into this problem for your project, you can click the link for an in-depth explanation. But remember, this kind of manipulation should only be applied on the training data. The test data should be kept as is to keep it a simulation of what you expect in production. In the second half of this video, we'll look at features. Even if your data originally comes in a table, as it often does, that doesn't necessarily mean that every column can be used as a feature right away, or that this would be a good approach. The main issue is that in databases and other data management systems, there are many more types of columns than machine learning systems can handle. You have dates, phone numbers, images, categories, tags, and so on. And for machine learning models, really the only two types of features allowed, numeric, categoric, or a mixture of both. In short, we have to translate data from the types at the top to the types at the bottom. There's no standard approach that you can always use, but we'll look at a few examples and hopefully the general idea becomes clear. Let's start with a simple one, age. If we need to translate to a numeric value, then we're translating from an integer value to a real value. This is not usually an issue and we can just make the translation directly. If we are forced to use categoric features, for instance, because we're using a model that cannot consume numeric features, then we'll need to somehow group the data. We can, for instance, group the data into binary categories above or below the median, or into more categories like child, young adult, adult. In this case, some information loss is unavoidable, but if you have a classifier that only consumes categorical features and it otherwise works really well on your data, it may be worth it. Here's a more complicated example, a phone number. Now at first glance, you might think that a phone number consists of numbers, so we can just interpret these as really large integers. This would be highly problematic because even though these can be interpreted as numbers, the distance between them doesn't mean anything. If you and I have phone numbers that, when interpreted as integers, are close to each other, that doesn't make us very similar. The distribution here is entirely random. Here it makes much more sense to look at the phone number and extract a number of categorical features, such as area codes or the difference between a cell phone and a landline. So what if our model only accepts numerical features and we have some categorical ones? This is very common. Most modern machine learning algorithms are purely numeric. 
how do we feed it categorical data? Here are two approaches. In integer coding, we represent each category as a separate integer. So in this case, we have four categories. So we use the first four non-zero integers to turn our categories into numbers. This gives us the same problem we had earlier. We are imposing a false ordering on unordered data. We've put comedy and sci-fi far apart from each other and romance and sci-fi close together. And that will imply to most models that make use of this data that sci-fi is more similar to romance than to comedy, which is not the case. To avoid this, we can use one-hot coding. In one-hot coding, we introduce a new numeric feature for every category in our single categoric feature. So here we have four categories. So we introduce four numeric features where we use only the values 0 and 1 to indicate whether or not that category is present for this particular instance. This hopefully gives you some idea of what goes into crafting a machine learning data set. But there's one step we can take beyond taking the features that we are given and turning them into features that are consumable by machine learning models. And that is to add extra features that are derived purely from the features we already have. To illustrate, let's imagine that we have a linear classifier. So we are quite limited in what kinds of relations we can represent. Essentially, each feature can only influence the classification boundary in a simple way. It can push it up or down. It can't let its influence depend on the values of the other features. Here is a slightly contrived example of where that might be necessary. Imagine classifying spam emails on two features. To what extent the email mentions drugs and to what extent the email is sent to a pharmaceutical company. And we'll assume that if a normal person not working at a pharmaceutical company receives an email mentioning drugs, that it's always spam. And if an email sent to a pharmaceutical company not mentioning drugs, that is also always spam. And an email is ham if it doesn't mention drugs and is sent to a person not working at a pharmaceutical company or if it mentions drugs and is sent to a person working at a pharmaceutical company. This is an instance of what is known as the XOR problem, which gives us these four quadrants in our feature space. And the key here is that these classes cannot be linearly separated. If we are using a linear classifier, then this problem cannot be solved from these two given features. We could add more features by gathering new data, but we can also take the two features we are given and combine them. That looks like this. So we have the first feature that indicates the extent to which the email mentions drugs, the second feature which indicates the extent to which the email is sent to a pharmaceutical company, and the third feature which we now introduce, which is simply the value of the first feature multiplied by the value of the second feature. And note that if we do this, then in the ham cases, we either have a positive, we either have two positives in the first two features or two negatives. We have two positives if the email mentions drugs and is sent to a pharmaceutical company, and two negatives if the email doesn't mention drugs and isn't sent to a pharmaceutical company. Both of these cases yield a positive value in the third feature. If there is a mismatch, one negative and one positive, either the email doesn't mention drugs and is sent to a pharmaceutical company, or the email does mention drugs and isn't sent to a pharmaceutical company, then the third feature gives us a negative value. This means that based on the value of this third feature, we can very easily linearly classify the emails. If it's higher than zero, we classify it as ham, and if it's lower than zero, we classify it as spam. If we learn a classifier on the third feature, and then color our original feature space based on the judgments of the classifier, the picture looks like this. The classifier learns to separate the feature space perfectly into the four quadrants we need. Now, the important thing to realize is that this is a linear classifier, but operating in a 3D space. But since the third dimension is derived from the other two, we can still color our original 2D space with the classifications projected down to 2D. And the general message here is that a problem that cannot be linearly classified in a low dimensional space may be linearly classified if you project the data to a high dimensional space. Here's another example. Here we color points red if the distance to the origin is less than 0.7. And again, this data set is not at all linearly separable. Using Pythagoras, however, we can express exactly how the classes are decided. If the square of the first feature plus the square of the second feature is less than the square of 0.7, then we classify as red and otherwise as blue. So if we have as our features 
the square of the first feature and the square of the second feature, then our problem becomes linearly separable. Then we get a linear decision boundary. And this is something we can also play around with in TensorFlow Playground. Here, we see again the XOR data set, four quadrants divided into different classes. This is not linearly separable. So if we start gradient descent for a linear classifier, we see that it doesn't know what to make of this data set. Using these buttons here, we can add extra features to our data set that are derived from the original two features. For instance, if I click this button, we get a third feature, which is a product of the first two. If we reset our classifier and set it training, we see that it very quickly learns to solve the problem. Similarly, if we use the circle data set, where all points within a certain distance from the center are colored blue and all points larger than that distance are colored orange, we see again that a purely linear classifier in this feature space cannot solve the problem. We know from Pythagoras that the square of the first feature plus the square of the second feature expresses the square of the distance from the center. So if we add those two values as new features and make our data set a four-dimensional data set, then in that space, the problem can be solved by a linear classifier. And if we reset the model and start it searching, we see again that very quickly it finds a good solution to the problem. And this doesn't just work in classification settings, it works in regression settings as well. Here we have some data with a very nonlinear relation. It looks more like a noisy parabola. We try and fit a linear model to this, it doesn't do a very good job. If we add another feature, which is the square of the original feature, we see that we can fit it perfectly. We can see this as a more powerful and more expressive model, but we can also see this as a 2D linear regression problem, where we have one feature x, another feature x squared, with the second feature derived from the first. The reason all of this is relevant is because linear models are extremely simple to fit. As we saw earlier, we can actually work out the optimal solution analytically. We don't even have to search for it. So by adding derived features, we can have our cake and eat it too. A simple model that we can fit quickly and accurately, and a powerful model that can fit many nonlinear aspects of the data. So to summarize, adding features can make a weak classifier, especially a linear one, much stronger. Any function on one or more of the existing features can work and the model stays convex, easy to solve with an optimal solution guaranteed. Common choices for new features to introduce are all two-way cross products, which means for every pair of original features, we add their products. Note that this includes the square as well, the product of a feature with itself. And if we want to go further, we can also add all three-way cross products and so on. And if you're struggling for interesting things to do with your machine learning project, this is often a good way to go. Start with a simple machine learning problem, stick with linear classifiers, which are easy to train and fast to compute, but try and figure out which features you can add based on the original features to make your classifier more powerful. In the next video, we'll look at normalization, how to control the scale of your input data to make it easier for machine learning models to deal with.